All right, to-do list for the week. I got robbed. I took a bath. Now go on Wikipedia. You know, it's pretty hard to go, hey y'all, Scott here, here's a Wii U, when you just got robbed of everything that you hold dear, so why not? Let's take a look at the game consoles that were held the most dear to the most people based on their sales. Of course, you may go, Scott, you were just robbed of everything. How do you have consoles to talk about? See, that's where you're wrong. I plan ahead of time. I have theft-proof items. I just spit on them a lot, that usually does the trick. My game console's still better than yours, just look at my resume! See, there's a major difference between a video game player and a video game talker. Guess which one I am. Well, what was I just doing? It's fine, I can go without talking about video games, I can just play them and everybody's happy. Wario. See, our type has to care about how well a video game company is doing. It's like rooting for your favorite sports team if you didn't even watch them play. I didn't buy Bravely Default 2. Gosh, I sure hope it does well. It just makes you feel good seeing the company that makes your favorite game system doing well. Like, man, there's gotta be some overworked employees in there. It's also just interesting to analyze those sales numbers. Why are they going up? Why aren't they going up? Why don't I play video games instead of talking about how much they sold and why you should care? How about this? Let's take a look at the 14 best-selling consoles of all time, and if I don't convert you to a video game talker by the end, I'll officially play a video game. There's a lot writing on this. Of course, let's remove consoles that are still being actively sold, so anything post-2017, because those numbers will forever be changing. I always looked at that best-selling video game consoles of all time, page on Wikipedia back when I was a kid, it was cool to see what was the most popular and think about why that might be. Why did this console sell so well, or not as much as it could have? If we actually figure it out, who knows, maybe we can more easily predict what will happen in the video game industry. The SNES being in number 14, see what I can amount to? The Super Nintendo Entertainment System sold just over 49 million units. What a little bitch. Yeah, only 49 million units, which is quite good. I mean, it is one of the best. But when talking about the most successful game systems of all time, numbers in this region aren't normally brought up. It's crazy to me that some of the most iconic systems out there, the NES, Sega Genesis, Nintendo 64, Atari 2600, sold as few units as they did. Now, 49 million is still a lot, but the SNES didn't do as well as it could have. It's hard to believe, but ever since the NES, Nintendo systems were going down in unit sales. The SNES sold 13 million less than its predecessor, and with the sheer quality of games that are released on it, we need to expand the definition of treason. However, the sales decrease makes sense for a couple of reasons. To many consumers, the Nintendo Entertainment System was merely the hot toy for a few years. The idea of upgrading your video game console to the next big thing it didn't make much sense to them. Why would I get that new Nintendo? This one works just fine. And it smells. They viewed it as a toy or something along the lines of a VHS player, and the only reason why you'd upgrade either of those is if your last one broke. But I think what made an even bigger difference was the Sega Genesis. You hear a lot of people that went from the original NES to the Sega Genesis. Yeah, treason. The NES didn't face as much competition. Anybody that got in this way, <laughs> it has a body count. I mean, any competitors just weren't exciting. Nobody looked at an Atari 7800 going, damn. The Sega Genesis was Nintendo's first piece of major competition. Without it, obviously, I think the Super Nintendo would have sold significantly more. But as it stands, I'd say it sold as well as it did due to amazing games and loads of them at that. Though it didn't sell as much as it could have due to heavy competition from Sega and the climate of upgrading video game consoles at the time. Man, that's just sad. The Xbox One, estimated to have sold roughly 51 million units, not bad. Bad. The PlayStation 4 absolutely demolished the one by selling over twice as many consoles. Now, to be fair, the Xbox One is a week younger than the PS4. So it's been on the market for less time, let's give it that. But the Xbox One struggled to put much of a dent into the PlayStation 4's tyranny. And if you were there during both consoles reveals, you know why. The PS4 had a nearly flawless track record with fans from reveal to release. Sure, getting rid of backwards compatibility was lame, but hey, here are games and a system. Holy sh**. The Xbox One's reveal was watered down by talks about Kinect, TV, and streaming functionality, watching live sports, sports titles, Call of Duty. It was everything people despised about the Xbox 360 at this point, wrapped up in a neat little piece of sh**. As time went on, it was revealed the console would require an internet connection to work. It would block used games from being played, and the system would retail for $499. And at E3 2013, Sony revealed that the PS4 wouldn't be doing any of this and cost $100 less. Spec sheets showcased how the PS4 was actually more powerful than the Xbox One, and the game Sony revealed for the console 
I mean, they weren't amazing, but they were games. That initial reveal ruined Microsoft's chances to sell more Xbox Ones. Ever since, you just ask, why would I buy that instead of a PS4? And honest to God, I don't know any live being who answered that. The exclusive games just weren't there. The PS4 took a bit to get some genuine must-have exclusives, but when they started hitting, it was already all over for Xbox. Their exclusives were either more Halo, Gears of War, and Forza, or some of the most forgettable exclusive games I've ever seen for a system. And a lot of the best games you could only play on Xbox One, well, they were also available for PC and or eventually came to other consoles. And even Microsoft mainstays like Halo had a rough time on Xbox One. The Master Chief Collection launched in an abysmal state. Halo 5 was Halo 5. Gears of War just kept trucking along and only really appealed to Gears of War fans at that point. And even then, some Gears of War fans don't care anymore. And Forza's good, but it's f***ing Forza! The only reasons to get the Xbox One was for the Xbox Game Pass service, which was a great deal. You get all these different games for a small fee per month. The backwards compatibility they started offering later down the line which was a legitimate knock against the PS4, which had literally nothing of this nature, or just because your friends are on Xbox and you wanted to play with them online. There was no other reason to get the Xbox One, but the Xbox brand has millions of diehard fans. No matter what, you want to stick with Xbox, and over time, the Xbox One with revisions became more affordable, consumer-friendly, and powerful than what Sony was offering. Due to its similarities with the PS4, most multi-platform games came to Xbox One, which didn't make it immediately unappealing. Millions of these console sales are from people who literally just play FIFA and Call of Duty. And wouldn't you know, do I have a console for you? The Nintendo DS. Coming in at 61 million units, the Nintendo Entertainment System took the world by storm in the mid 80s. You'd think for something this popular and iconic, it would be in the 6 billion units sold range like water. Frankly, the NES did a ton of heavy lifting popularizing video games as a viable market, a medium you could trust. The Atari 2600 initiated the home console boom but failed to capitalize on it in the long run, burning retailers and consumers out with the lack of quality and quantity control. Thus, the original Atari only sold 30 million units, which is pretty surprising considering how popular and iconic it was. Though back then, these things were huge investments, especially considering how new the video game industry was. Not as many people were willing to splurge on that kind of entertainment. I'll think about it. The NES effectively doubled Atari's install base by not only being more trustworthy, huh, but being home to games every kid had to play. You needed to get Super Mario Brothers. You needed to get The Legend of Zelda. And these were experiences that would last you a while. A system as popular as the NES in the 80s would have sold twice as many units today. I feel like capping it off at 61 million is just because of it being released in the early days of home console gaming. Because the statistics just don't make any sense. So in 1991, you're trying to tell me only a little over 1% of the world had access to Snow Bros? <laughs> okay. Now this is interesting, the Nintendo 3DS. Frankly, I think only four people bought these things, they just like getting all the colors. Roughly 76 million sold, that's no easy feat, but that's pretty much half of what its predecessor sold, the Nintendo DS, spoiler. But why such a steep decline? Gamers would praise the 3DS nonstop, lauding it as this massive success when there were more PSP-like systems that sold more, like the PSP. And that was considered to be a slight disappointment, but see, gamers like the 3DS, and they aren't people. The 3DS didn't win over the same casual market the DS did, mainly because around this time, those users moved over to smartphone gaming. Any casual-oriented titles on the 3DS that were sequels to DS successes usually didn't turn out that great. I mean, the 3DS was fundamentally a DS with some pro guts. <laughs> it's like casuals don't care if Nintendogs is running on a dual-core CPU now. They already moved on from the DS line of handhelds, and the glasses-free 3D display wasn't gonna bring them back because they weren't interested in buying anything that was 3D outside of a 90 minute trip to the movie theater. Thus, Nintendo's hit list decreased. The 3D has primarily appealed to core fans and kids. And with how cheap the system got, you can't blame some people for jumping into it even if only one game interested them. I know for a fact, millions of people would just buy it for one game or two, plus many fans would upgrade their handhelds when new ones would get announced. This number does not represent the amount of active users at one time, not by a long shot. To be fair, you can make that argument for all video game systems, but the 3DS had 
six revisions, with each and every one giving some knuckleheads a reason to upgrade. I've seen people upgrade to the new 2DS XL because it looks so nice, the top screen looks like a smartphone. Yes, they went to public school. The 3DS was a handheld many bought because they wanted Nintendo experiences and they weren't gonna invest in a corpse. Yet outside of that core demographic, there really wasn't a reason for most casual users to care about the system. It looked like a kid's toy. Many people were embarrassed to play it in public. Yeah, well guess what? It doesn't want to be seen being played by you. I mean, Nintendo's advertising during this generation was so bad that many haven't even heard of this thing yet. And when they did, can you blame people for being embarrassed for liking Nintendo? But because of a vast and appealing lineup of software, consistent hardware revisions, and a gimmick that got some people interested at launch, the 3DS sold well. Just not as well as other Nintendo handhelds. What happened here? The day the PSP sells over 80 million is the day I... Well, I don't want to finish that sentence and f myself over. How did the PSP sell around 81 million units? Who talks about this system anymore? The PlayStation Portable was a big deal, no doubt, but anybody I knew who had one, I never saw them play it. Fast forward to today, and it's not discussed nearly as much as you think it would be considering it sold as many units as it did. Now, that may be because I'm sheltered, but the PSP overall seems to be something most people look back at fondly, but don't want to revisit a ton. Kind of like an old iPod, like, oh man, so many memories with this thing. Want to use it for music? Oh, f no! A lot of people will say the PSP sold well because everybody knew it was easy to hack and you could put emulators on it. Most people don't even know the 3DS exists, why would they know that? I think the PSP sold this much due to the excitement of what it was and represented. The PlayStation brand was on top of the world. The PS1 and PS2 won their respective generations with record-breaking numbers. Everybody owned these consoles. They dethroned Nintendo as the market leader, and now they're entering the portable scene with a handle that can do PS2 quality visuals? We were all used to 2D sprites on the Game Boy Advance. We could all only dream of taking PS2 games on the go, and the PSP promised exactly that. Dozens of articles claim that the PSP was going to win the war against the Nintendo DS because, by God, why wouldn't it? You got Spider-Man 2 at the launch, and this ain't no phony baloney Game Boy Advance or Nintendo DS version. Nah, this is gonna be the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube Spider-Man 2 on the go! Do you have no shame? So I think the PSP did live up to the hype of being a home console to go. I mean, games like this on something so small is still crazy impressive to me. It had a decent amount of console ports, so you could be playing that PS2 game just in a morgue. But some games weren't the console versions. They were watered down PSP versions, like Spider-Man 2. This isn't the same game as the consoles. It's still an impressive handle game for the time, comparable to a console game in many ways, but it's not the console game. So it makes the PSP feel like, oh, it can't do this. But then the games that were the exact console games on the PSP, well, the PSP was comparable, but not as powerful as the PS2. It lacked the two triggers, a second stick. Even if it were a perfect port of the game, it would still be inferior on the PSP. Camera control there would always be some garbage workaround. Exclusive games in the biggest franchises were relegated to PSP entries. Most of them were inconsequential to their series. It wasn't the next Grand Theft Auto game, it was Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, a side game. The same goes for the God of War series or Gran Turismo Killzone. A lot of these PSP versions of console mainstays were done by B-grade developers, not numbered mainline entries in their respective series. It made the PSP feel like something you could totally skip and not miss anything on. Either way you slice it, the PSP was impressive. There just wasn't a lot to keep players coming back. Yes, it was console quality on the go, but that can only get you so far after a purchase. You go, wow, this is just like a PS2 game, but that means it's not super designed for portable play. And on top of that, the PSP used a spinning disk drive, which good luck playing that on a horse. If you play it at home on the couch, why not just play your PS2? If you're playing it on the go, it's not as portable friendly as something like the DS. There were better alternatives in both scenarios. I'm still in awe playing the PSP. It's so tiny yet plays games of this graphical quality. However, I think many players bought one, played it a bit, then kind of just moved on. It had some amazing games and impressive hardware, but it just felt like many people bought the PSP out of hype, liked it, but didn't really go back to it. As a kid, the true success of some products normally doesn't dawn upon you. NASDAQ was only my 47th word. But back then, it felt like everybody and their mother owned a Game Boy Advance, and with it selling 81 and a half million units, that was practically the case, though, 
it sold roughly the same as the PSP? That doesn't seem right. It was almost the de facto game system. No matter who you were, you had a Game Boy Advance, and that was due to a few reasons. The price entry was incredibly low. This was one of the cheapest and easily accessible game systems out there at the time. The name and brand was undeniably recognizable. Even these days, people still refer to anything with a battery as a Game Boy. It won't hold up in court, but it just goes to show how iconic the title of Game Boy is. And of course, the games. Not only did the Game Boy Advance have constant releases of all types, whether they were Nintendo first party titles, third party, or licensed kids games, but the Game Boy Advance was compatible with Game Boy and Game Boy Color games as well, luring in owners of those past systems and new ones as it already had a library of hundreds of games upon release. There was something for everybody here, something for the core gamer and something for their stepdad's daughter. And with three redesigns, people had incentive to upgrade from the first model to the newer Game Boy Advance SP. Which makes me think 81 and a half million units seems a bit lower than I'd expect. I think what stopped the GBA from selling even more was the lack of a definitive hook outside of, it's a Game Boy, but more. Nintendo truly excelled in sales when they introduced something new with a gimmick that's not just, it's more powerful. The Game Boy Advance is probably their most recent success that didn't have any major gimmicks involved. It was a video game machine through and through, which is why so many people adore it. But looking at its successor, it's obvious while Nintendo can successfully make a standard game console in the modern day, they still need a specific hook to lure everybody in. The Xbox 360 is well known as the winner of the battle between it and the PlayStation 3. Who did it pay off? 84 million units sold, the 360 dominated the better part of the battle for the seventh generation, and for good reason. Nobody wanted a PlayStation 3. Well, in actuality, I think everybody wanted a PS3 to some extent. The follow-up to the uber-popular PlayStation 2, it was considered the most powerful thing on the planet. Move over, Christ. But that price point was disgusting. And the amount of games just wasn't appealing. The Xbox 360 had a year head start on the PS3, had far more games, was considerably more powerful, and was pretty comparable to the PS3 graphics wise. Even though that system was more powerful, many developers didn't have the time or money to fully take advantage of it, so they developed games for the more accessible Xbox 360 first and foremost, then maybe brought them over to PS3. Exclusives like Gears of War and Halo brought millions over to the 360, while the PlayStation 3 was struggling to sell. Online play was better on Xbox, many preferred the controller, Digital Netflix streaming was exclusive for a bit, and in 2010, they introduced the Kinect, which revolutionized the act of hatred. That brought an entire new subset of consumers over to the brand, all of them casuals who simply thought the act of kicking the air was worth 150. Because of this, the Xbox 360 became the face of hardcore gaming. That original model and controller are burned into my brain as what you think of in an unfinished basement setup. But after the Kinect launched, it felt like Microsoft put the 360 in autopilot. The only exclusives releasing at that point were more Kinect games, which frankly, after about a year being on the market, I think most people who bought the thing gave up on it. Or they were sequels to series that already kind of peaked. The entire marketing campaign for Halo 3 was finishing the fight. Do it again. Right when the 360 started to pump the brakes, the PS3 was entering a bit of a renaissance, which brings us here. Just Barely beating the Xbox 360 right when the generation came to a close, the PlayStation 3 sold 87 and a half million units, which surprised many. Like, I think most people still think the 360 won this war. This system was almost always seen as a flop in comparison to the competition, being overpriced, overpowered, under good. But like I said, by the midway point in the generation, Microsoft stopped giving people as much of a reason to buy a 360, while Sony was continuing to pump out exclusives. In June of 2013, I saw so many people buy a PS3 just to play The Last of Us, and that was even the year the PlayStation 4 released. Sony was hell-bent on saving the PS3 after it was flopping hard, redesigning it twice. These models may not have been escaped capable as the original, I mean, they removed the Spider-Man font. Frankly, the PS3 didn't sell initially because it cost too much and there just weren't enough exclusives in third-party games, and most of the third-party games ran better on 360 anyways because it was easier for developers to program for. However, Sony addressed many of the complaints as the generation went on, and I think the PS3 is a shining example that poor sales at the start, well, those don't mean things won't work out in the end. Just you wait. This was the biggest sensation of all time. And it didn't even sell 102 million. I'm not sure if there will ever be a something as hot as the weed during its heyday, or at the very least something that feels like it. Every store you'd look, they'd be sold out. People were flipping them for three times more on eBay. And this wasn't just the hardcore fans wanting them. Everybody knew how hard it was to get a Wii for the first three years of the product's life. And 
everybody wanted one. It, it was a sensation. It didn't matter you didn't know what it did, you just knew it was what you needed to buy. And it was all because the Wii captured the world's imagination. Utilizing motion controls to swing tennis rackets, it made tennis possible for many of us. And the initial price of $249.99 was lower than the Xbox 360 and definitely lower than the PlayStation 3, and that was because the Wii was incredibly underpowered. It was basically just a souped up GameCube spec-wise. The Wii cost roughly $2 to produce. The games helped showcase how amazing these controllers were. Online capabilities allowed users to download classic games, and with the Wii just flat out being able to play GameCube discs made it capable of playing games from all prior Nintendo home consoles and then some. The price was affordable to many, so why did the PlayStation 1 outsell it? I think that fact alone makes Nintendo hate the alphabet. Well, the Wii's success could also be attributed to it being a fad. Millions bought it, loved it, and kept buying software for it, but many of the sales were from people who bought it just because they thought it was their civil duty to do so. Buy it for Wii Sports, maybe buy Wii Fit afterwards, you're done! Didn't help that Nintendo stopped supporting the platform as much around 2011, and this was the time where if you didn't already have a Wii, you probably weren't gonna buy one then. After everyone who wanted a Wii bought one, they were readily available. There wasn't that huge urge to buy one as much, especially considering there wasn't a ton of compelling software releasing from 2011 onwards, while the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 were much more exciting around then. These consoles had a future. The Wii felt like it was old news, especially considering the lackluster graphics, not even including HDMI. There were some great core titles on Wii. But if those interested you, the 360 and PS3 were probably going to satisfy you a bit more. The Wii appealed to a casual market, and that's the reason it was such a runaway success. But that success was fleeting. It didn't stick around, and sales started to slow down. It's obvious the Wii did well, but there's a reason why developers still preferred to make games for competing platforms. I think Nintendo could have made this the best-selling system of all time, but the Wii hardware and third-party support forced consumers to give up on the Wii quickly. Hell, Nintendo did, and thus, after a while, there wasn't a lot of excitement in buying one anymore. Yeah, it only sold 101 million units. I can do that in my sleep! The original PlayStation. Right off the bat, we have to comment on how incredible of a success this was. The first system by a newcomer. This wasn't Nintendo, this wasn't Sega, this was Sony. But it was proven that during this time, anybody could make a video game console that successfully competed with Nintendo. Sega just proved that with the Sega Genesis, and Sony just went too goddamn far! The PS1. It's incredible how successful it was. At the time, a video game system selling 100 million units, it was unheard of! The use of compact discs can be credited to a lot of its success, as these things were cheaper to produce and could hold so much more information than regular game cartridges. The PS1 was significantly cheaper than the Sega Saturn, and released two years prior to the Nintendo 64, meaning when that system launched with two games, well, one game and one event. Right when that system was getting started, the PS1 already had hundreds of games. They were getting sequels to Blockbuster PS1 exclusive that already released. All the third-party franchises you'd expect on Nintendo, well, they went over to the PlayStation, and on top of that, you could play your music CDs on this thing. Still a step away from Season 4 of Wings, I know, but still! The PlayStation had literally everything going for it during this time, and it didn't get discontinued until 2006, the year the PlayStation 3 released. Even after the PS2 came out, it was a solid budget option for many people, especially with its cheaper redesign. This thing was a runaway success. It's one of the easiest success stories to analyze. Well, that and... The PS4 did as well as it did because it wasn't an Xbox One or Wii U. The Xbox One shot itself in the foot, we already know that. And because of the resistance many consumers had towards the Xbox brand at the time, Sony took advantage of that. They highlighted all the issues people had with the Xbox One and clarified that they wouldn't be a problem on the PS4, while also revealing their system cost $100 less and was more powerful. It made me look at anybody who bought this as a fucking moron. I think the Xbox One had more compelling exclusives at launch, but it didn't matter because eventually the PS4 started to get blockbuster after blockbuster exclusive game, a feat that the Xbox One just never reached. Frankly, I do truly believe the PS4 did as well as it did because it was really the only choice for many. I mean, he didn't want that because it was more expensive, less powerful, and already proved itself as untrustworthy in an alley. He didn't want that because... Just buy a PS4. People flocked to Amazon after Sony's E3 2013 showing to pre-order PS4s, which I always found silly because, like I said, I do think Xbox had a better initial showing of software during that E3. Look at the PS4's first year. The viewer discretion is advised. 
While I think the initial success of the system had a lot to do with the Xbox One's failure, eventually the PS4 found its footing with must-have exclusives, and on top of that, it had all the third-party games, and the best versions of them. Now, after both companies redesigned their consoles and pushed upgrades out the door with better specs, the Xbox One X was more powerful than the PS4 Pro. But at this point, it didn't matter. The war was already over. While the Xbox One became the more advanced system, the PS4 still had the games people wanted to play. What do you want me to say here? It's the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Of course, I will maintain, I will admit the Game Boy and Game Boy Color aren't separate systems and the color was just a mere refresh of the Game Boy when I'm dead and buried. Still not buried, but Nintendo groups these two together, so sure it counts. But the reasoning behind the success is pretty much the exact same as the Game Boy Advance. It was the go-to thing to get kids for the back seat. It was cheap enough to buy one or even a couple for multiple kid households. The inclusion of Tetris in the package, well that lured in millions right there. Not only kids, but their parents as well. This was one of the first instances of a Nintendo product being marketed towards everybody, not just kids. And we can see that works well for them. The initial price was $90. $70 for the redesigned Game Boy Pocket. It was so cheap for a game system. You didn't have much of an excuse. And if you did, well, you're probably trying to cover up something. Other handhelds had color screens, lit screens for that matter, but the Game Boy had affordability and a never-ending game lineup to boot. Now, now, this sales figure is definitely a little skewed considering not only are we including the original Game Boy, but Game Boy Color as well. Though, to be fair, the Xbox One X is included in the Xbox One sales, the PS4 Pro with the PS4, the new 3DS with the 3DS, and that had exclusive games just like the Game Boy Color did. The amount of new 3DS software though, what are you standing there for? Go! How the hell did this happen? The Nintendo DS sold over 154 million units. Am I alone with originally thinking the Wii was a bigger phenomenon? Well, while everybody was talking about not being able to buy a Wii, everybody was buying five DSs each. Think about how the Wii's success was fleeting and how software became sparse in the final years. And flip them. The Nintendo DS kept Rolling. It had a very similar strategy to the Wii, really reeling in the casual consumers with games like Brain Age. However, it did a better job of appealing to literally everybody. There were games of all kinds on the DS, and the system was at a power level where you could make games for it on a budget. It was cheaper to make DS games for many developers because you didn't have to worry about games not being asked for the eyes. And the games kept coming well after its successor to the 3DS release. Pokemon games kept coming out for the DS until 2012, and with this being a cheaper handheld with multiple revisions, it wasn't uncommon to upgrade. I got the DSi after I had the DS Lite, it's good to know I'm two of this number. It's just unbelievable the handheld sold this many. But to be fair, families get multiple DS's for all the siblings, and handhelds get scuffed up more often, thus you're more likely to upgrade them. To something like the Wii, well the family shares that, and when they release a revision, it's usually just to cut costs and offer a lower price for new customers. And there's really no incentive for people to buy multiple consoles, while the DS was a completely different story. This was the go-to handheld, everybody had one because there wasn't much bad press around it. Outside of Scrabble using the word f***er. Of course your mom liked you owning a DS. You did math and whatever the f*** this is. So it's understandable why a handheld and not a console like this would be such a huge sales juggernaut. And then there was Sony. The PlayStation 2 sold 155 million units, which is obscene. Look at this graph. There's almost no point to having a graph at this point. The PS2 sales numbers can be attributed to many of the same reasons why the PS1 succeeded, but the difference is the competition wasn't completely arthritic. The GameCube was more powerful than the PS2. It used mini DVDs, but still. And the Xbox was so much more powerful and also used DVDs. But the PS2 had backwards compatibility with the PS1, instantly making a no-brainer for the 100 million PS1 owners. It once again had a year head start on the market. It could play DVD movies right out the box when DVD players were expensive and not as common. Many people just said, F it, I need a DVD player, a way to play ants, and a way to play ants. I'd be stupid not to. Let me repeat that again. I'd be stupid not to. The third party support carried over from the PS1 and Sony was once again funding countless exclusives that rocked the world. Uh, sure, the Xbox had a lot of what the PS2 was offering, but the PlayStation brand became one of the most widely trusted in all of gaming. After 100 million PS1 users saw the PS2 was here and could play movies and all their old PS1 games, in addition to the big new releases and pretty much all of them considering developers didn't want to miss out on the PS2, I mean the only games that missed the system? 
Well, can you blame me for going with GameCube? I think it just goes to show that the best selling consoles aren't always the most powerful or they don't always have the best games of the generation or whatever. Those elements help, but at the end of the day, it depends on the context of it all. Like, is it the PlayStation 2? If it is, it'll do well. I don't make the rules. Okay, well, that was a way to blow past 30 minutes. That still doesn't change the fact that I was robbed of everything last week, but everything will be fine. I'm looking at the bright side. I may have been robbed of everything, but that means I can't get robbed anymore. That's my solution to everything. Scared of home invasion? Go homeless!